between different colonels and people that disagree with the chief of staff, who don't like the way the chief of staff deals with things. And so rather than kind of going in a, you know, uh, an orderly fashion, they seem to be coming up with these, these memorandums and these coup attempts, etc. And when you read through these coup uh, attempts and these memos, it's amazing to see the comments they had about, for example, Oskuk. I mean, they wrote about him as if he was Erdogan's best buddy, and I don't think that those two gentlemen are ever put in the same category. The, bo the bottom line is that the military has been chastened, and it hasn't found a new role for itself. And I think this is where the international can come in and have a major impact. The Turkish military has always had a particular role, but as that role has changed, and as the Turkish parliament has kind of matured and become a more, more important in uh, influencer within Turkey, uh, there's not been anything to replace the military. There, you know, the judiciary has attempted to do this at different points in time, and the major case that was brought against the AKP uh, that barely did not close the party showed how close that the, uh, the Turkish system came to, you know, kind of the stability being, uh, being broken at that point in time. And here, it, you know, even in the last couple of days when you read the news reports, it seems that there's a low-grade civil war not happening just within the police force, not just within the judiciary, but within the military. So in this type of environment, the question is where do we look for stability? And it seems that the only place there is stability is the AKP. That's where there's continuity. That's where there's stability. That's where there's been uh, the, the most kind of successful reform process, even if it has become tired over time. And so the question is where do we go from here? And, you know, what are the main forces of opposition? Well, as an optimist, I have to point out that more than half of Turkey doesn't vote for the AKP. So there are votes to be won out there. And a lot of these votes, admittedly, are identity votes. And the question is, can the CHP, can the MHP that currently represent the opposition, can they capture those votes by looking beyond the old framework of what they've represented? Can they get beyond their old fractious politics and move beyond? And part of the answer has to do with, are they creating a next generation of leadership? And I think very clearly in Turkey, that's been one of the biggest weaknesses. There has not been a next generation of leadership. There has not been a true grassroots mobilization in the way the AKP has been able to do within the secularist quarters. You talk to many secularists who complain about the AKP, and you say, okay, well, who do you support? Well, I vote for CHP, but I don't really like them. These guys are horrible. They're miserable. I would never vote for this tribal leader, etc. And so the bottom line is, is there going to be somebody that emerges? Is there a new generation of Turkish leader that is able to come that combines the charismatic abilities of the current prime minister, that is able to combine the strategic thinking of the current foreign minister, and is able to kind of bring all these factors together into a new statesman for the new generation of Turkey? And I think that I'll stop here and allow us to move into the discussion before we move into the uh, international factors. Let me stop there. Great. Um, thank you, Joshua. <clears throat> um, I'd like to just offer one observation and then pose a question to, by the way, all of us on the panel, regardless of what we're here to talk about, should feel free to join in on any, any of the discussions at any point. But <clears throat> I think a very important uh, broad issue of principle comes up here with Turkey and the military issue. Um, those of us who work on Turkey tend to think sometimes that this is especially a uniquely Turkish problem. Um, in fact, the history of most of the developing world in the 20th century has been a question of the role of the military. For one very good reason. In many developing countries, um, which would often be ethnically divided or had lacked any kind of strong civil institutions in the modern, modern period, their military was the first organization which brought people with broader education, uh, who thought about the world, who thought about the nation, who, tr who tried to think about issues above the level of region or tribe or ethnicity or whatever else, uh, and that could, in a way, represent the beginnings of a new nation state or, 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 or just a new state. Uh, the military was better equipped than any other group usually within society at that point to do it. And we find in most countries, in the Arab world, in Africa, if we look at Latin America, the classic military runnings of, of, of Middle East, of, of uh, Latin American states, which still, we barely have gotten out of that era in Latin America. And it's for very good reasons, because of this, in many ways, the skill and the importance of that kind of broad education that, that the military has brought. But in the process of democratization, obviously, slowly the hands of the military and its power and its intervention through extra legal means, these hands on power are slowly being pulled away in one country after another country. Uh, Turkey happens to be now well advanced 
uh, in this process. But if we look at other states in the region, if we look at much of the Arab world, they're still essentially military dictators, and we find Iran itself now drifting into an increased military role at this particular juncture, away even from the mullahs who, who ostensibly are running the country. So this is a very broad phenomenon. Turkey is not alone, and from my longer range perspective, and I don't live in Turkey today, so I can take maybe have the luxury of a longer term view, um, the process of civilianization, if you will, gradually of the country is, is well underway with, its, with all its problems. Um, okay, I would now like, uh, I'll, if I may take my uh, prerogative as, as chair to pose the first question, and I'd like to put it to you, Ahmed, uh, since you and I had been talking about this anyway um, uh, yesterday, um, there is genuine concern in Turkey and particularly on the part of women about what the role of the AKP might be, uh, what, whether it's light Islamist or Islamist roots or conservative or however you call it. There would seem to be some concern on the part of some women's groups or many women's groups about the future for them. Could you talk on that? And, and I know you've had this even within discussions of your own family. <laughs> no, you, you, you're absolutely right. And I think at the heart of the gender debate in Turkey is the headscarf issue. There are rightly so a group of uh, Turkish uh, uh, intellectuals, uh, women or men who consider uh, the headscarf as subjugation of uh, women. And basically, they see beyond uh, this rhetoric of democratization, human rights, etc., a uh, kind of approach to uh, gender issues, which is uh, uh, very patriarchal, rooted in the kind of uh, Islamic worldview where men are on the forefront and women are, are, are behind. And there is this sense that what has been achieved by uh, the modernization of the republic, what has been achieved by Ataturk, uh, is now uh, threatened by this advance of uh, conservative uh, values and uh, this, uh, this ubiquity of the headscarf uh, everywhere uh, in Turkey. And uh, it is a polarizing issue, which makes it perhaps even more polarizing is Turkey's understanding of secularism, which considers the headscarf not just a sign of religious identity, religious freedom, religiosity, but a political symbol, an affront to the secular uh, uh, identity of the republic. This is why the headscarf uh, has been banned uh, in public universities in Turkey, and this is why the issue continues to polarize the country, and Turkey is not unique. There's another country called France where they have a major problem with the headscarf as well and where the gender debate is very much similar to the one in Turkey where you have uh, intellectual feminist leaders, uh, uh, a, a kind of Republican elite of the French Republic which believes that uh, Islam uh, and this uh, headscarf uh, is a, uh, a threat to uh, the values uh, of gender equality, the values of enlightenment, the values of modernization, progressive ideals. Uh, in that sense, I think uh, AK Party is in a disadvantage when you look at the big rallies, the secularist rallies against AK Party. On the forefront, you saw often women who basically said, we don't want to go to the dark ages, we don't want to have an Islamic uh, system where uh, we would be, uh, this kind of headscarf would be imposed on us. They are afraid, in fact, that uh, if there is really a uh, legalization of the uh, headscarf, uh, if you, you, you lift the ban on, on, uh, in universities, you legitimize the headscarf and you basically create an environment whereby there would be what is called in Turkey now societal pressure, neighborhood pressure, mahalle baskısı, on women to wear the headscarf. And this is of course part of the media debate in Turkey where there are reports and actually think tank reports as well which argue that this current government has an agenda in Turkey, a slow agenda of uh, Islamization and that they are slowly establishing